Welcome to our second round of sessions. Joining me now is Benjamin Krantz. He is the principal of Krantz Associates, a corporate immigration law firm based in Toronto. Ben practices Canadian immigration law exclusively with a focus on corporate immigration. He is active in his field, having written various texts, including North American Relocation Law and the Corporate Immigration Section of the Human Resources Advisor. He, he has also written for professional journals and other periodicals, including the Law Times, Immigration and Citizenship Bulletin, and the International Human Resource Update. Ben served as a lecturer at the University of British Columbia Certificate in Immigration, Laws, Policies and Procedures Program, and is a frequent speaker, having spoken for organizations, including the Law Society of Upper Canada and the Canadian Employee Relocation Council. Thank you, Ben, again for speaking at one of our events. Good luck on your presentation. Thank you very much. And I can be heard and we're all good. Okay, here we go. So we have very limited time, so I can just touch on a few highlights, but our focus today is looking at what's involved in getting people uh, from abroad to work in Canada. Certainly not something you can take for granted. And it's certainly something that has not slowed down through COVID because uh, you know there are all kinds of economic issues and uh, pay, uh, labor market issues and things, but there are certain specialists or experts or executives or whoever you may need in an organization that uh, you still need in Canada. And uh, of course, things are opening up now a bit, but we're just gonna touch today on the general framework for the system and uh, some of the impact of COVID. And uh, hopefully this will give you enough information just to allow you to uh, know where, where to start if you do need to deal with it, because again, we have limited time. So that being said, we're gonna cover today what we call LMIA and non-LMIA work permits. You'll see those are the two basic categories and we'll explain that. And we're gonna look at very briefly at some of the other issues that go into um, consideration on a work permit, not directly related to the work itself, but more on the on the side, you can say, uh, compliance issues and admissibility, et cetera. Before anything, we need to mention something called the NOC, the National Occupational Classification. Every job you can ever think of is uh, somehow classified into the NOC and that and classifying the particular job you're looking at hiring someone for uh, will make a big difference in how that is treated, it will impact salary, it will impact all kinds of things. So you need to know the knock code of the job you're looking for. It's a bigger grid than what you see there. Uh, there's a link you can follow to find more details on that. And it, it will probably change in about a year. They're updating the system, but for now, this is what we deal with. If you drill down on any one of the knock codes, and this is just a random one I used, but you see software engineers, it tells you what that job does. And it's important to know that because Whatever your title is, it's a question of what your qualifications are, et cetera, that fit into here to see if you qualify in that category. So the basic work permit scheme boils down into this slide. And the first, there's an invisible bullet, which is that we don't want foreign workers in Canada. I know it sounds draconian, but that is the reality. We want uh, to protect our Canadian labor market. So we generally, so we want to limit foreign workers. And the first way we do that, do that is by having uh, employers obtain what's called an LMIA before they are allowed to bring in a foreign worker. That's a labor market impact assessment. And we're going to discuss what that is. However, sometimes you can get a work permit without an LMIA. And if you can do that, that's usually what you want to do. There are various exceptions and we'll look at those as well. Sometimes people come to work in Canada without a work permit at all, but certainly we cannot take that for granted. And we'll briefly touch on that. And there are ongoing obligations with temporary workers in terms of compliance, which we'll touch on. So. A labor market impact assessment is a, a, a gate that the government uses to decide when an employer will be allowed to bring in a foreign worker. Now, if you're, if you work in this business, you will often find that we need an L, people say we need an LMIA for Miss so and so, but it's really not the individual you're getting the LMIA for. It's the employer uh, who is seeking permission to bring in a foreign worker. And these, what you see here, are a paraphrase of the legal requirements. Uh, to convince the government that they should allow you to bring in a foreign worker and, and hire them in priority over a Canadian worker. And you'll see that item C and D, I have asterisks because all the other ones are nice, but without C and D, you are not going to get your LMIA approved. And that is you need to be filling a labor shortage and you need to be paying appropriate wages, which are based on the NOC. So yet again, you need to understand the NOC. So in terms of um, a short uh, labor market shortage, how do we show that? Well, basically, in most cases, we need to recruit and there are specific requirements of how you recruit. You must advertise or uh, in appropriate places for in three 
locations for at least four weeks in the prior three months. One of those locations must be the Canadian Job Bank, and you have certain obligations with regard to matching. There is a fee, as you see, $1,000, and there is uh, there are different requirements based on the type of job, which yet again depends on the NOC. So you need to understand that. Usually, it's high wage occupation, so that's going to break down by province and the actual wage, but those will be further filtered by NOC. So you need to know, but it's usually what we call NOC, zero A's or B's, which are management level or those requiring a university or college level education. There are sub programs within the LMIA that allow people to get work permits to, to companies to get LMIAs in a more expeditious fashion. Sometimes if the uh, particular job happens to be in certain NOC categories, uh, there are that are provided for from time to time, or if they're in the top wage earners in a particular province. And besides that, there's a specific program that came into effect, I guess about two or three years ago, called the Global Talent Stream, which allows companies to by bypass the recruitment requirement. And just the government assumes already that there's a shortage in certain occupations. And those are mostly listed in as category B occupations. You can see there are a few listed, there are actually a, a bunch more, but they're all sort of IT occupations. Category A are, is where a company sort of gets a pre-approval that it is a, a company that is innovative and therefore needs to hire people and doesn't necessarily have to show a specific uh, occupation. But in any event, employers can use this, no recruitment, two-week processing, so it sounds like a great idea. And it is, but don't forget that there's a downside in that you the employer must also offer the government something in exchange. You, three items usually uh, are three benefits, and those include things like uh, inc increasing uh, revenue, increasing uh, diversity training, um, and uh, hiring more Canadians as well. That this sort of will create opportunities. So you do need to look at the back end of that program as well. So that is a very quick overlook at LMIAs, and then we're going to look at the exceptions to the LMIA. So if you can fit into one of these, you can hire a foreign worker without using uh without needing an lmia so the most common one is an intra-company transfer which means that there's someone already working for the organization in, in an affiliated company outside canada they've been there for at least one year in the last three and are currently working there um, and that the companies are somehow related usually with a 50 percent control mechanism there are nuances to this we can get into but we just don't have the time sometimes you can't argue less than 50 percent if you are the de facto owner but you need to worry also about that the person has, uh, this is probably the most important part, they have either executive or senior managerial level uh, capacity or they have specialized knowledge. And specialized knowledge, the definition was actually changed a number of years ago, now requires advanced experience plus proprietary knowledge. It used to be either or. And um, the thing, so, so even if you have the smartest nuclear physicist in the world, if that nuclear physicist doesn't know your particular company's issues, proprietary issues, uh, they're not getting a work permit. So you have to look at all the legal requirements. There are various legal bases for intracompany transfers. Uh, they're based on various treaties and we don't have time for all of them, but you do need, they're overall, they're pretty similar, but there are some differences of nuance in terms of how long you can extend and things like this. And an extension in on some of the newer treaties, which are the CETA, the treaty with the European Union and the CPTPP is with Pacific Rim countries. They've broadened it a bit to allow for management trainees, which is more difficult under the older treaties. In addition to intercompany transfers, another LMIA exemption is the uh, professional category under, well, here, here's a list of a few others. We're gonna look at them uh, quickly in a little more detail. Professionals is one, uh, and something called reciprocal benefit, significant benefit, and some other categories. So professionals under certain treaties, if, the, if you need to hire a worker, uh, that has a particular occupation, you may be able to bring them into Canada without an LMIA. So the most common is under CUSMA, that's the Canada-US-Mexico Agreement, formerly known as NAFTA. By the way, it, it really hasn't changed with regard to immigration provisions. So whatever, if you knew something about the old NAFTA, it should be the same under the new agreement. But there are about 60 occupations that we can bring people in on. Note that you cannot self-sponsor yourself, uh, though you have to still be sponsored by a company that's bringing you in, but you don't have to be an employee of that company. You might be, for instance, uh, an employee of a U.S. company that has been hired by a Canadian company to carry out some function. So there's a, there are some ways to deal with that as well. You can see some of the more common examples, but you need to be careful there as well. You need to check the NOC definitions of all these things. 
And, you know, some things like management consultants sometimes are uh, used rather broadly, so you have to be careful. And there are some less known, less used ones, perhaps, hotel managers and such um, that uh, are available, but uh, you have to have the need for that, of course. And again, you need to check the specific requirements and you need to have a pre prearranged employment. But again, employment doesn't need to mean that you're on payroll. There are other agreements, you can see them listed here, that provide for professionals. Looking first at the left side columns, except for the first one, I'll come back to the first one, but the Chile Chilean, Colombian, and Peruvian agreements are similar to the CUSMA agreement in the sense that they are based on occupation. This, these, the Chilean one is more or less identical to CUSMA in terms of pigeonholing specific occupations. The Colombian and Peruvian is still similar, but rather than pigeonhole occupations where you can qualify as a professional, they list occupations where you cannot qualify as a professional and everything else is okay. It's a negative list, but it's still the same idea. On the right side of the column, you have the more uh, modern versions of these agreements. They sort of changed their, their model. And under the South Korean, European, European Union and Trans-Pacific agreements, we no longer say that you need to have a certain job. We really, really rather say you need to be at a certain knock level, usually university education, and then you can come work for a temporary period. You'll see there, there are breakdowns of what we call contractual service providers and independents. There are some different provisions uh, depending on how you fit into that, how long you, you need to have worked in the past and your level, et cetera. But these are some of the basic ideas. The uh, last one, I come I'll come back to the first, the very top left category, GATS. Uh, this is not a sort of bilateral or even multilateral treaty. This is a, um, a an international instrument that people sign on to. It's the cousin of GATT, which people are more readily familiar with, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs. This is the General Agreement on Trade and Services, and it does allow for certain professionals as well. Most notably, it's a limited category. Uh, most notably, it's engineers and computer specialists. Uh, but you only get three months. So why do I need three months, you might ask? Well, A, that may be all you need. And B, uh, it may be sort of a bridging mechanism while you get an LMIA in the background. So if you have an engineer from, not to pick on any particular country, but it, it does happen commonly from India, it's going to take a while perhaps to get the LMIA, but maybe you can get them here quickly on a GATS work permit and then transfer them behind, uh, sort of seamlessly to, a, to a, um, an LMIA-based work permit after the fact. I, I'm not going to touch much more on this, but as I mentioned that uh, CETA is the European Union agreement, which is relatively new and has certain pr pr provisions that didn't exist under CUSMA, sort of they're, they're uh, uh, evolving these agreements as they go on, they get they recognize certain issues, but they do have the graduate trainees to the intercompany transfers, and they do allow for these independent professionals, et cetera, based on a university degree. That's you know, the most important aspect. Similar with the CPTPP, which is the Pacific Rim countries mentioned there, there are all kinds of caveats, though. It depends on the country. There, there are different issues. Um, they do slightly define specialists slightly differently, so there may be some room to argue different issues there. And their professionals all expand the university education bit to actually allow for uh, technicians and people like that as well. There's another category called reciprocal benefit, which on a sort of institutional level, there are programs that allow for countries to bring Canadians in and therefore we bring foreign workers into Canada working holidays and things like that. But it can also be used on a sort of more individualistic level where a company says, we send all kinds of foreign workers abroad. Canadians are getting opportunities abroad. Let's bring in some foreign workers and the government does allow that sometimes. There's another program, the Francophone Mobility. If you are in a NOC zero A or B occupation and you speak French relatively fluently and you're working outside Quebec, then you might be all eligible for a work permit without all the other problems. So it sounds too good to be true, but it's really out there. As I mentioned, there are other categories. Yet again, we just don't have the time and there are um, uh, com pro LMIA exemptions that come and go. For instance, I mentioned there the Alberta construction workers, which disappeared a while ago, but it's just an example of that. But another, just to qu quickly mention, we have significant benefit, which is anything you can argue to bypass an LMIA. But as you might imagine, an officer uh, doesn't want to just simply allow you to get away with out an LMIA. There has to be a really good reason to allow that non-LMIA work permit. And emergency repair, uh, this might sound like it's a no-brainer. We should just let people come in to fix the products they sold us, but it wasn't always that easy. But now you can get it for 30 days. 
assuming there's basically no one in Canada to do that. So again, those are the two primary ways of getting work permits, either with an LMIA or if you can avoid that without an LMIA through various programs that we've discussed. Sometimes you can come to Canada to work though without a work permit, such as here, there are a bunch of categories, roughly 20, but here are just some examples of the more common ones. Clergy, foreign journalists, and entertainers, you know, every time, I don't want to name any particular performer, but somebody comes to do a concert, they don't need a work permit. There's kind of a reciprocal understanding that entertainers will be allowed to do this. Uh, to be careful though, that if you're coming here to, to make it your full-time job, like you're going to open a company where you provide a wedding band, that's not the same thing. There are some details here you need to worry about. And also clergy can get away, so to speak, without a work permit, but then there are implications about their ability to see permanent residents down the road. So there are pros and cons you have to look at. But the big issue on non-work uh, permit work is a business visitor. So the first thing to recognize is that business visitors are working. No one is saying that they're not working uh, under the law. They are, it's just they're doing activity that the law has uh, waived the requirement to, to get a work permit for. Um, now, where that dividing line is, is not always that clear. And uh, But you do have to show things like you're either buying or, or getting training on uh, Canadian products, intra-company training, they're not the same as intra-company transfer, uh, selling to the not to the general public, and things like meetings. But if you think about it, if your job is meetings all day and you're coming to do a meeting, then you're working. So you're not necessarily a business visitor. Uh, some of the traps we see, if, just to mention, like, first of all, in terms of legal requirements, you must be paid from outside the country. But that that doesn't mean you're a business visitor. It is true. For instance, Bob Smith needs to come from the U.S. to Canada, and he's paid on the U.S. company. So clients call me all the time. So he's a business visitor. No. Uh, yes, it was one requirement that he paid from abroad, but that requirement alone uh, doesn't tell me that he's a business visitor. It depends on what he's doing here. Same thing with being the place of business remains abroad. Um, so again, it's not always that easy. And also it is not the length of time. People say, I'm just coming for a few days. You know, that might be a psychological uh, benefit to say that it's, it's likely not really entering the labor market, but not necessarily. Um, so I wouldn't uh, take that for granted. And people sometimes just self-label themselves. Oh, I'm just coming as a business visitor. Well, yeah, do you know what the def legal definition is? You better be careful. So despite the fact that this is done, of course, literally uh, pre-COVID anyway, <laughs> millions of times a year, um, and, and certainly it's not uncommon, but don't take it for granted. People are turned away and there are issues many times with this type of application. So that's the basic work permit scheme. Again, either you need an LMIA or you don't, or sometimes you can work without a work permit at all. In terms of uh, COVID, um, people may be aware that in the last uh, month or two, uh, borders have begin, begun to reopen. They, they just reopened into the U.S., uh, November 8th, but that's a different story. That that's, that doesn't mean anything in this direction. Uh, yes, of course, it does impact for logistical reasons, but in terms of legal issues, right now, if you are vaccinated with an approved vaccine, it's been at least two weeks, then more or less you can enter just like you did before COVID. But to be aware that there's still random port of entry testing, and in the business context, you need a quarantine plan still just in case, because if you test positive, you still have to quarantine. So it's unlikely, but uh, you have to be prepared for it. Now, the next few slides uh, I, are the slides that existed sort of before that reopening of, of borders, uh, but recognize that, I'm not gonna go into detail, but recognize that these still exist for people that are not vaccinated. So if you're not vaccinated, you need to comply with the rules as they were uh, you know, a couple of months ago, dating back to roughly to March, 2020. Um, so that does require quarantine. And it, it'll, it disallows discretionary travel, all these things, you know, for our purposes, you can come to work, but that will require, you know, the, the quarantining, the testing, um, and that you show that there's a place to stay. If you're essential, you can bypass the quarantine. Essential is defined in that website you can check. Um, and uh, it, basically you can come to Canada in a non-vaccinated situation if you already have a work permit, if you're coming from the United States and don't need a visa, so you, you can be British as well, you can basically apply like you did before, even if you're not vaccinated. But again, recognize you may need to um, to quarantine if you're not essential. And if you're coming from anywhere else, then you need to apply online. There's a whole process um, that didn't used to exist uh, that you still need to do if you're not um, vaccinated. And of course, 
Uh, either, no matter if you're vaccinated or not, everybody has, still has to do uh, COVID testing within 72 hours of departing for Canada. Again, we're not going to go into too much detail on the uh, COVID. Most people are now okay, but if but during COVID, they did a real laugh for flag polling, which means essentially renewing a work permit by exiting and re-entering. Um, they they did allow for a process where you could change employers more easily, not wait for the necessary approvals. And uh, they did allow you to uh, have biometrics waived if you were already here and things like this. So, you know, for vaccinated people, you're more or less good to go. For unvaccinated people, uh, you still have to conf- comply with all those requirements. And even for vaccinated people, again, there is a chance that you will have uh, a random test and may need to quarantine. I would just have mentioned as well that for people that have criminal records, there are inadmissibility issues, uh, so be aware of that. And companies do have ongoing compliance issues, uh, it, both in terms of COVID, ensuring that they've provided for quarantine, et cetera, uh, and in terms of general work permit issues, like, um, you know, are you paying what you said you would pay? And uh, are you have you changed the terms of employment and things like that? So that being said, that's my basic talk. And uh, hopefully that's been of value. Uh, if there are any questions, I can stay for a few minutes. I'd be happy to take questions. I know it was quick, but uh, again, we have limited time, so hopefully it had some value for people. Okay, well, it seems there are no questions, so I will wrap this up. Thank you everyone for coming. And if you do have any questions in the future, you have my contact information, I believe, and you can get a hold of me. Actually, I will put my contact information in the chat box. So once again, uh, there don't appear to be any questions. And uh, given that, I will be logging off. Thank you very much.